All right, well, welcome. We are on the right week this time. For those of you who showed up last week, I was having a senior moment, which seemed to be coming with greater frequency <laughs> as time goes on. The uh, topic tonight is water, but if you're from New Jersey, you say water. And uh, if, you, uh, if you live in New Jersey, then you get coffee from the Wawa and uh, maybe a bottle of water. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a completely different language, seriously. It's, it's quite humorous. So anyway, <clears throat> let's dive in. We have what we call a universal survival priorities, meaning pretty much no matter what your situation is, you're gonna follow these priorities. And um, water is number two on the list. Number one is shelter, which means you have to protect yourself from the elements. Number two is you have to stay hydrated. Number three, you have to maintain body temperature. And number four, you have to nourish your body. So it's, it's really quite simple, right? If it were that simple, everybody would know how to do it and everybody would do it. So we have to figure out how to, uh, how to, how to create a, a better sense of what's involved. So here's the thing. What do we got to know? We got to know how much the waters the human body need to drink each day under stress. That's the, the key element here is if there is stress, you have to, you have to consider what it takes to keep, keep yourself properly liquefied. I know there's a word there, it's just not hydrated. coming. Hydrated, thank you. So about half a gallon a day is minimal. But under strenuous conditions here in the summer, you need 12 to 16 cups. Plus you're gonna need water for sanitation, teeth brushing, keeping your hands clean. So you're gonna need at least a gallon to a gallon and a half of water to be able to uh, function. So if you have a family of four, four gallons a day for one week is 28 gallons. Someone do the math for me and tell me how many gallons does it take for a month? Lots. That, that's my scientific answer. Was it 120? I don't know. You're asking me to do math. That is a dangerous proposition. 120 gallons. Per person. Oh, no, that was for the family of four. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. Okay. Well, see, there it is. I'm, I'm, I've got caught doing math again. That's three large barrels, and I don't have that. Yeah. So, we're going to talk about water from the perspective of finding and obtaining it, from the perspective of storing it, and then how to purify it. It's not all that difficult, but we have to be thinking about all three of those things. So finding water, where can we find water here? Well, we have a river, we have reservoirs, we have Baker Dam, we have the uh, Sand, Sand Creek, Sand Hollow, upper and lower, is it Sand Cove? Yeah, whatever it is. What's in Pine Valley? We have a reservoir in Pine Valley. The Santa Clara, head of the Santa Clara River. It's the headwaters for Santa Clara. It's a, it's a good spot too. However, we have to get it home. So we also have wells, opportunity for wells to be used and rain catchment. Rain catchment is surprisingly efficient. So let's talk about rivers and lakes. That's a 275 gallon box that'll hold family of four, most of your water. You have to fill it up every few days, but put it on a trailer or in the back of a pickup truck, drive up, pump the water in, 
drive off. <clears throat> These things aren't very expensive. I don't know, I think sometimes we influence the market. We started advertising that this would be a good idea and suddenly the price went up on them. <laughs> so blame me. They're, uh, they're usually <clears throat> available. Sometimes you make, want to make sure you don't have a chemical one, one that was used for chemicals, but a lot of times they'll use them for um, sweetener. And they, oh, agave. agave syrup. I have a couple at home that had agave syrup in them. And they clean up real nice. And I get some agave syrup out of it. Because <laughs> they, oh, usually, nice. they usually don't drain it all the way. They drain it down until it's easy to get it out. And then they leave it for us. Good evening, Larry. But what you'll need for this is a pump. And um, <clears throat> one that's caught my eye is a fluid pump made by Ryobi. It uses drill batteries. And, we'll, and we'll, I can pump pretty good with Ryobi drill battery. So think about that. That's, a, that's an option. You know, the old hand pump, that would work as long as you're not in a hurry. So you've got to pump and fill it and bring it home. And then you have to purify it because this system is not pure. It'd be pretty hard, you'd be pretty hard pressed to get water out of the lake that you could usually drink. Wells. Um, there are community wells, such as Diamond Valley and Dameron have. Dameron has outsmarted all of us because they have a private well with solar powered pumps which I wish we would get on the stick and do in Diamond Valley. And uh, there are grants available. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, there's just really no reason not to have independent water source. So, you know, that's something for us to all think about. And then when the grid is down, you can get your own well with a post hole digger and uh, some extension pipes. I have a friend that did it. Up he drug, dug down about 25 feet, hit water, put in a pipe, and was good to go. Do you have any idea how far the water is down? Well, the guy that just walked in the room could tell you that. How far is our water table below surface? <laughs> nope, not, <laughs> not going to happen. But, you know, the whole idea of solar, <laughs> solar pumps that's something to think about. Getting some grants, getting some. So for private wells, you would have to hire somebody to do it if you did it community. Yeah, and you know, as long as the government is up and functioning, they don't like that. So, because there's water rights, quote unquote. So, you know, anyway, something to think about. Wells are an option. Yeah. I have a question. Not to mention this to cover anybody, but what is it okay to, if you found a water source, to drill a water well and use valves, or is that something you cannot? Oh, there's a, it's all the water, right? Yeah. 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 It'll be theft until everybody needs it, and then yeah. nobody will care. But for right now, I would say, you know, obey the law. All right, rain catchment. This is a great thing for this area. Um, 55 gallon drums up on an elevation with a rain gutter attached. You would not believe how much water comes off your roof after it rains. And uh, if you can preserve it, catch it and preserve it, it's great. If you don't have rain gutters, you can put tarps up and catch it in the, in the, in the, in the, swell of the of the uh, tarp i have caught i've i've captured dozens and dozens of gallons in a single hour-long rainstorm like 30 or 40 gallons that way used to be it was illegal to catch rainwater 
Um, and I, I don't know if it still is, but. No, it's not. It was changed in two thousand fifteen. Yeah, and you I'll, can't you can't build a shed that catches that you catch what's called on your roof. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, I don't care what anybody says. If it's if it comes down to it, I'm going to catch water. <laughs> if we ever get any, yeah. If we ever get any, yeah. It's interesting in the Utah State Legislature when they went through and discussed this because a lot of the water rights people in the state of Utah said that they were losing their water if people took it off their roof. And when they actually did a study, yeah. they found out that, all, that less than 1% of the water on the roof actually made it to the watershed. And if people collected the water, it reduced the floods in Salt Lake City by thousands, tens of thousands of gallons of water coming down the street. And well, isn't that interesting? That, they passed it immediately. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Yeah, well, heavens, it's government. Come on, you're asking too much. Now, I, you know what? I have spent a lot of time talking to Brother Kazir about water, and and um, I can tell you that Diamond Valley has a pretty good setup, pretty good system, and as long as we stick with it, we're probably going to be okay. I'm still encouraging him to get that solar power, but. <clears throat> I'm not recommending becoming a renegade. So blue food drums are the easiest way to store the water. They are a pretty cheap. Um, the, you might have to uh, get a pressure washer and clean them out. But for the, as a general rule, you can stack 10 of them together, pipe them so that when one fills, it runs into the next one. When and that one fills, it runs into the next one. It's super easy to do. The 275 gallon food container uh, stuff is great. Make sure you know what was in it before you use it. And then you can go to, to you can go to Home Depot and buy a, a water storage container. You can go to Family Still Matters. Um, you have a big one, don't you, Shane? Mm -hmm. And Lynn's Market sells them as well. Lynn's? Cow Ranch. Cow Ranch. And Carter, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of availability. It's just a matter of getting the will to get out there and get it done. Can I make a comment about the blue barrels? Mm -hmm. We store ours outside. And if you don't stay on top of your bleach every year, you're going to get a thick, nasty layer of algae in those, even though ours get no direct sunlight. Um, so it was a pain. What we had to do was put rocks in there with bleach and detergent and roll them. Mm. and roll them and roll them to get those cleaned out. So prevention is the key. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a good point. Twice a year. I've never had any problem, but I've never stored them outside. All of mine have been stored indoors. I have 50 gallon, 55 gallon food steel drums too. And uh, they, they have a good lining in them to, to make it easy to clean. So, you know, there's lots of options. It's just a matter of being Cost conscious and, and, and aware. All right. I have another question back here. Mm -hmm. For Doug. Um, I, I have a, a, one of the big black uh, water containers I've got. Mm -hmm. Does that have a tendency to blow an algae in it, or is that another is that the black like sudden and penetrating where it doesn't show us? Any stored water will grow that big. Unless you store, unless you unless you mix that yeah. with additives. Oh, is this for me? Mm -hmm. so, so Jamie also had something. Else. Yeah. So the question is, what are you going to use the water for? Yeah. That, that, that's the real question is, if I have a 2500 gallon tank, what do you intend to use the water for? So, and when you answer that question. Yeah, and so if you have a Berkey uh, sitting on your counter, then you don't worry about it. Bring it in, put it through the filter, and you're good to go. Or you can do some things to, to add to it to preserve it and keep it pure, but it seems like a lot of extra work to me. For example, you can add bleach or peroxide. You can add colloidal silver. I've, I've been told by a reliable source that a silver dime in the bottom of a five gallon bucket or in a, in a 40 gallon bucket will keep that water from getting 
algae. I don't know if it's true or not. I've never used it. I know. I know. <laughs> Kyle has a question. What silver? 364. 364 silver, sorry. Should Comment? Kyle. Kyle. Hold on. I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, you can test it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good suggestion. I think of that, you know, these kind of additives as extremely expensive. You, you know, you're gonna probably run your yeah. stuff through a filter anyway. Bleach is the least expensive way to go. It doesn't take much. And then you bleach it, get it all, all that chlorine, it, it dissipates. It evaporates a lot. And, and it, it goes benign after a while anyway, so. Yeah, my, my attitude about it is. What are you I'll, leaving behind? Hmm? What are you leaving behind with the bleach? I don't know, but if you run it through a filter, you get everything out of it, so. Yeah, I just filter it. That's my thing. Um, you want to make sure when you store the, the containers that the plastic is not on the concrete. There's a weird interaction that happens. Some kind of lime transfer between the plastic and the, and the concrete. It draws the lime out of the concrete. And so as a general rule, get it up off the floor. It's also easier to access if it's up off the floor. Very easy to make a little stand like this for your 55 gallon drum. Pretty hard to get them up there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. How do you keep, if you have to keep it outside, how do you keep your connections, your, your uh, hoses and things from freezing? Do you, do you use the heat tape? Um, I, it covered? I don't care if it freezes. Well, doesn't it break the Connections. The, the the hose. Well, going into the tank. I've never had a problem. Has anyone ever had anything freeze and crack? Yeah. What, in what what was the situation? Uh, anything PVC will just yeah PVC is not a good snap situation. apart. And if there's water in your connections, it will just blow the the thing. If it's turned off completely at the barrel, it might not. Yeah. So, These so are all what is the correct? It's the hose instead of a. Yeah, I use I use the RV hose. Um, it's white. It's expandable. I mean, it expands pretty good. It doesn't split. I've never had a split. Anybody had any other experience? We put ours. We use ours as a dual purpose. We use our water on the bottom of the GI, but we fill them up with water and kind of break many. Put them in a greenhouse and when the sun comes in and the heat what we do with the water battery and if you ever need to you can take the water out yeah i've got a friend that that did the same thing in, in his house in new jersey and by golly he had hot water it it cut his water heating bill considerably yep you do an overflow so that it doesn't allow it to fill past the top of the barrel yes that will also help prevent those things from up above from freezing. yes that's true that's a good point and so your, your, your outlet is always two or three inches from the top to allow um, expansion, some expansion. Any other questions about this? I mean, this is a, this is a great discussion. I'm, you know, I, I'm about, all about it. If you can store it in your garage as opposed to outdoors, it's better for the, for the stuff because it doesn't freeze as hard. I mean, we, I had some friends down in Texas this last year and they had 275 gallon cubes in their garage. <laughs> ice cubes. That turned into ice cubes. They froze <laughs> solid. Wow. And you've got to think how much cold it is to get 275 gallons to freeze solid. They, they said, yeah, that didn't work out so well. Yeah, but they don't need electricity for their refrigerator. That's true. <laughs> There's a couple of potential options that people can freeze in. One is Get some foam board and make a little insulated room. Mm -hmm. Just box around it and put a little electric heater in there that has thermostat and it'll heat from freezing. It. Set it real low. Um, I have a storage room that has done that already. Yeah, you can do it even with a light bulb. Yeah. If you have a well enough insulated box around your 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 water box, a, a light bulb will keep it from freezing. All you're interested in is keeping it above 33 degrees. So 
to call the yeah, taxes. They, they have no power it. to do that. Yeah. And that it won't require electricity if there's these solar horse water heaters. You see, basically just make an insulated box that has a plexiglass front on it that lets the light in, but it insulates the inside. And yep, also, that's uh, a great suggestion. I am. Um, yeah, I mean, anytime you can use solar for stuff like that, all the better. So, yeah, go ahead. What do you think? There was a, I think it was online on YouTube saying they were taking their old Pepsi bottles or bottles and they were putting saline solution or salt water in there in the bottle and it brought the pipe putting that in the sort of horse trough or water trough and the ice would form around the back. That's an interesting idea. I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that. All right, let's talk about how to purify. Purifying is fairly simple. You boil the water, you chemically treat it, you filter it, you distill it, or you pasteurize it. Okay. Or any combination. So boiling means getting it up to 212. You get it up to 212 and then let it cool. It is biologically pure. You don't have to boil it for 10 minutes or anything like that. The chemical treatment means bleach or any of the other chemicals that can treat the water. Uh, filtering means using a Berkey or a, I have a, what's called a Pocket Pro, which is the best darn filter I've ever found, um, made by Ketadin. It's this big, it filters 1,200 gallons, and then you have to clean it. And it keeps going forever. Distilling it means making a, a still very much like this uh, with a pressure cooker. And pasteurizing is a new thing that they've been using in Africa with great success. And that is to fill a clear water bottle with pre-filtered water. By pre-filtered, I mean all the sediment is removed and then setting it on a roof for four hours. And the sun, uh, the, it, it is purified not by heat, but by solar UV, UV, yeah. UV light, by the UV light. Thank you. What kind of container does it need to be? It has to be at least, a, it has to be clear plastic. So soda cans or soda bottles work good, but they can't be green or blue or red or anything. It has to be clear. I have to take the label off. It's not a juice bottle. Probably if it's clear. It's remembered that plastic leaches um, phytoestrogens and stuff like that. So if I'm going to do that, I would do it in glass, clear glass. Yeah, that'd be good. Because phytoestrogens is, is, is absolutely toxic in the body from plastic. Well, if I, if I start drinking water from that and my voice goes up two octaves, you'll know that I got it. <laughs> That's not the concern, it's cancer. Oh, I know, yeah. Yeah, I'm just kidding. So yeah, glass is a much better thing. Glass juice bottles, uh, you know, in anything that you can find this glass will work great. And they do it in Africa now all over the place. So they put them on the roofs of their huts and they can purify several gallons a day. Yeah. You can order wabis online as W-A-P-I. It's a little thing that floats in your water and it will tell you when your water is at pasteurization ah, temperature nice. without having to use a thermometer. It just floats. So I've used the distill method. That gives you pure H2O. I can't remember if I have slides for each of these. Okay. Boiling, let's go through the pros and cons. Boiling is energy intensive. It takes a lot of BTUs to boil a gallon of water. However, we live in the solar kingdom. I have a parabolic dish that will heat its apex to 750 degrees all day long. And I can, I can uh, run water through that all day long. So what I did um, at, our, at my previous camp was I had a box for water that had a high input and a low input and a coil in between them. And I heated the coil and it drew water from the bottom of the tank and pushed it out into the top of the tank. So I had this constant circulation without having to do any work. And it was, it worked very efficiently. We can thank alcohol distilleries for a lot of this 
moonshiners for a lot of our technology here. Um, yeah, I just think of have to send Barney and Andy after me. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's all legal on a personal basis. <laughs> Only for biological contamination. It does not improve the taste. It does not remove um, organic matter that you can't, I mean, you really need to pre-filter anything. Yeah. We store a bunch of coffee filters. Yeah, coffee filters are the way to go. Or, yeah, it goes slow, but it does get all a bunch of the major sediment. Yes, coffee filters are an essential thing if you're boiling. Pull the coffee, I mean, pour the water through the coffee filter before you boil it, and you'll be much happier. Because sometimes the, the, the particulate matter in a, in a thing like that doesn't get purified by boiling, and you'll be really sorry 24 hours later. And it will save your water filters. They'll go yeah. much, much longer if you pre-filter. Exactly. All right, so chemical treatment only treats biological. You have iodine, bleach, and peroxide as your options. Not my favorite method of purification um, for the reason that they all have their ill effects on your body. You know, too much of any one of these is not going to be healthy. So um, just recognize the, the, the limitations. But their bleach is okay for storage. Yeah, you can treat your water to store it with if bleach. Filter, if you filter. But don't, you don't like Clorox stuff Yeah, you have to get pool. you have to get pool shock, which is what sodium hypochlorite. Just just cite sodium hypochlorite. It, it does have, as Clark and I discovered, the sodium hypochlorite. The pool shock has some inert ingredients that don't seem to cause any problems. But we can label them or just spray chlorine and water. It's all there. And, and be aware of every person that might drink that water because me personally, I am completely allergic to Clorox. So test yourself on it before you play that game on your water storage. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just generally saying chemical treatment is kind of my last ditch. If I have no other options for treating, that's what I'll do. Um, distillation, you need... Um, it's, it's energy intensive, but again, I have that energy source that will heat the, that, the bottom of that pan to 700 degrees all day long. And um, I just keep adding water and it keeps producing distilled water at the other end, 100% pure. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty remarkable. At the end of the day, I open that lid and look inside and there's all these, all this, yeah chemical crap, you know, the lime, and the, lime and, the, and the heavy metals. It gets rid of the heavy metals. It does a really good job. It's a great way to go if you have some form of passive energy. But if you're keeping a fire going to boil water, that's probably not very energy efficient. You'd be wishing you had that wood later on in the year. Filtration. You can buy a backpacking filter at a backpacking store, expect to get about 500 gallons per element. But they're pretty effective, they're pretty efficient, they work well. You can get a Katadin pocket, which is on the left there. That does about 10,000 gallons, and then you just clean back, wash the filter and do it again. And you can get a Berkey type, which do, depending on how many you put in, you do 12 or 24,000 gallons without having to, um, without having to do anything with it. Those are obviously great. Um, I, I have some of everything. I have some Berkey's, I have some Katadin, I have some, you know, so you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. She does. Well, we can talk about it later. Yeah. Until it's time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Now. Now's a good time. Okay. All right. She's going to raise the camera. Karen, I've been teaching preparedness for a long time, and water, as you know, as he's teaching tonight, is is absolutely essential because that's the leading cause of, of death in most third world countries is getting 
malaria or getting you know some kind of bacteria or um, virus from water. So having clean water, doesn't matter how many other preps you have, if you don't have clean water, you're, you're, you risk your health and your life. So I've got just some little pocket filters here. There are three stage as a pre-filter. You can put these on a little water bottle. You can put these on a Pepsi bottle. You can put them on a two liter. Um, you can just suck it directly out of water source or you can run the little cable down into the water. It's a pre-filter and it filters out all the visible solid stuff in there. And then there's a stage two micron hollow fiber me membrane that takes out 99.999% of bacteria, salmonella, cholera, E. coli, removes giardia, protozoa, and cryptosporidium. So this is a good little fill. This is a little two pack that we've got here. And then these are an inexpensive way to go. You need to get a food grade bucket. Um, it's just come out of my garage, so it's dusty. I've got four, uh, four sets of these and they stack on top of each other. You just drill a couple of holes, one on the bottom, and then you can drill a hole in the lid. This filter right here goes down inside right here. There's a radiation filter that will take out radiation if we have any kind of a nuclear event on the West Coast and that ends up blowing this way. You're going to have radiated water, and you want something that's going to take the radiation out. Uh, the government would never allow that to happen. No, of course not. And then the, these little uh, ceramic filter kits are awesome. These are really inexpensive. They're, uh, I mean, I have a Berkey. I have, I have like four or five different methods of water myself. This is a, the least expensive way to go. It's just as effective as a Berkey. It's got this little sock that goes over the top of it. It's a uh, silver impregnated ceramic filter. And this just goes in the bottom of, and you can use garbage cans. You can put three of these and stack two garbage cans, but then you don't know what plastic you're interacting with. You can use garbage cans. <laughs> and then this little filter just goes in right here like this. You pour your dirty water in here and then run through the pier into the bottom. And then this has a little spigot kit that comes with it. This goes in the bottom of the bucket right here in this little hole that you drill. And it's really easy, it's portable. You can just grab this and go put it in your emergency kit. Um, these filters uh, will do about 30 to 35 gallons a day, which is a lot. And it's got an unlimited shelf life, it's easy to install. Um, you can put, we did this for a steak preparedness fair here in Diamond Valley about 10 years ago. I don't know if any of you were there. We brought the nastiest, dirtiest water out of our ditch. We had just had rain and it looked like chocolate milk coming down the, and I thought, we're not even gonna pre-filter this. Let's just go get a bucket full of that water and take it to the steak center and, and, and you know, put pure clean water in the bottom. And we had Dixie cups where people drink. People were terrified to drink the water even though it was perfectly clear. So it, they will go a long time. You can clean these uh, the surface of these filters a um, hundred times with a little scotch bright. So if it starts getting, you know, a little Slow, bit cloudy. It slows down. Yeah, you just get a scotch bright and just clean it up and put it back in there and it will go um, 10,000 gallons pretty easy. So these are really inexpensive. They're like $59. And um, these little sets right here are 39 and that's two pocket filters in here. And I've got the specs on these and also the radiation filter. It, this removes radiation, this one right here. And- um, We'll put Jamie's uh, yeah. website down on the bottom of the page. Uh, yeah, it's discountpreparedness.com, but I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you have. And I've got the specs on these if you wanna just pass them around and look there? at it. Yes. Yeah, you said you needed four buckets. Can you put four high or do you need two sets of two? No, I just, you just, I just have four sets of two. Because I'm planning, a, yeah, just so that I can have enough to share with neighbors, enough so for bathing, for you, cooking. And do you, are the holes pre-drilled or do you get instructions on where to put them? In the you get instructions, it comes inside of here. It tells you exactly what size drill you need, drill bit you need, and it works really, really well. We've used these. She's going to water not only her family, but her horses. <laughs> we, and goats and chickens. And we did actually have to do that. We lost our well in Brookside. And uh, this is about, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago for, for seven days, our well collapsed. And most of the people in our community went to town or they had to transport their animals elsewhere because they did not have enough water. And we were able to, just by having water storage and water filters, we were able to 
to stay in our home and have plenty. Our yard got a little dry, but you know, with the middle of summer, of course, that's always when these things happen. But you know, you gotta be prepared. You gotta have it on site and not always count on the fact that you're gonna be able to. Okay, now, and we could not drink. get the county to bring any water in. Yeah, this is drinking water. What do you do for non-drinking water? Washing. I, I ran my, my laundry water through here. I've got like a little uh, washer, hand washer thing. We did we did our laundry at home. We did everything. Yeah, but you, you, you purified that water to, to wash those water? I did, I ran it through. Since I had so many filters, we were just pumping it. We have a little siphon pump that we were pumping it into these. We just set up a big plastic table like this and put them out there. Do you have stores now? I don't have, I have an online store. Yeah, I've been doing this for 36 years. I. And I was going to tell you about sun ovens. You can pasteurize water in a sun oven. You don't have to bring it to a boil. It takes so much energy to bring water to a boil unless you've got a parabolic. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I'm scared to death of parabolics because I am well. They're just too hot for me. But they are amazing. Well, you don't want to put your hand out there. To... <laughs> Laser beam through. Yeah. <laughs> but um, anyway, you can, if you have a sun oven or a solar oven, even if it's a homemade solar oven. You can put a mason jar of water in there and you can put, you know, other containers, but you know, a pail or a pan or whatever. If you've got a little whoppy, you can float that little whoppy and it will tell you the wax flips it upside down. And like, okay, now I know my water's pasteurized. So you know that it's free of the bacteria and the viruses. So good stuff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jane. And you'll pass this one. Okay. So summary, find water. <laughs> Purify water, store water. And that is all there is to it.